Again, let me tell you one fact that we humans are not alone in this room. We are sharing this room with millions of bacteria and microorganisms. And these bacteria are not just outside the body, but they are also inside your body. They are part of our digestive system, which makes our health and gut better. Now, what else can you do with these microorganisms? Well, you can edit them at genomic level and make them produce whatever you want. They can be the biofactories from fragrances to flavors to different kind of chemicals and even treat diseases too. So I've been uh, fortunate enough to work in the lab as well as outside the lab in different industries like fashion and textile. So I've seen the wonder which happens when two different world collides. For the next few minutes, I want to share my own, own experience and thoughts about how science is making our daily lives better every day. Let's look at this picture. What do you see? A premium, lustrous, luxurious silk fabric, right? Now let's look at this picture. This is the fact behind production of such premium fabric. This is the wastewater coming out of industries uh, from textile. India is the second largest producer of silk which is producing around 1,61,000 tons of silk, which is almost enough to wrap up the entire planet in a luxurious cocoon. Now, just imagine, for producing that much amount of silk, it's required how much amount of water? Fresh water. And how much amount of fresh water is released into the environment as wastewater? So, uh, let's understand the process first. This is the entire process for production of silk fabric. Now, out of which, dyeing and degumming takes most of the fresh water and releases the highest amount of wastewater. What is degumming is, uh, is called? So, degumming is the process where sticky, gummy protein, which is also called as sericin, is removed from the silk fiber, and then that leads to a smoother and shinier fabric. Now let's understand how it is done in the industry. So this is how it looks like, the conventional process. In industry, industry uses combination of soaps, alkali, soda, and they put it together in a water at boiling temperature along with silk, uh, raw silk fiber. Now raw silk fiber is made up of two proteins. One is sericin, the other is fibroin. So when you boil protein at highest temperature, it denatures, and that's how we are getting the average quality of silk at this temperature. So I worked on this problem. I decided to talk to a lot of industry stakeholders. I spoke to vendors, Central Silk Board, understood the entire infrastructure processes, and then I came up with a solution. So in this process, I invented a process and an agent where you put the raw silk inside, uh, inside the solution, for a few minutes, remove it after a few minutes, and then just wash it with hot and cold water, and that's it. The silk is degummed. <laughs> Even after washing the silk fiber, the remaining solution can be used multiple of times without throwing anything. And even after multiple cycles, there is a solution remains, which can again be used to recover sericin peptides, which again goes into cosmetic and pharma industry. So no waste there. Good, right? Similarly, we identified another problem, this. So while making leather, we generally avoid this cruel process, slaughtering of animals. What if we could substitute the slaughtering of animals and provide much better and healthier, greener leather? <coughs> this is how we did. So we grown bio leather inside our lab. You, you can grow it in different sizes, shapes, thickness, even, uh, even you can work around with texture and design, and this is how it feels like. Exactly look like leather. It feels like leather, you can have same maintenance and durability rules for this leather as well. Now we work with a lot of other biomaterials from biofoam, biopolymers, and we practice all those projects in terms of a show called the Bio Fashion Show. So here we train fashion designers on how to create these materials first and then use these materials in their fashion show, 
in their fashion clothing. And then on the day, they present their creations on stage. And they are rewarded so that they can continue their work further. Now let's take a step, step back and understand where it all began. Picture this. You are a college graduate. You want to work on a project. Where do you turn to? College labs? Industry labs? So let me tell you, college labs, they can't accommodate all the projects. They have very limited resources for a very limited set of people they have to cater to. They have academic calendar going on. And in that academic calendar, it is very difficult for them to accommodate your own project. Then you go to industry labs. So industry labs, they have their own set of protocols, experiments. Everything is fixed according to their own needs, right? They can't accommodate any external ideas. Then where do you go? This was a similar case I faced during my project work in 2015 when I graduated from the college. Then I came across this concept called DIY Bio. Do-it-yourself biology lab. So this DIY Bio lab is practiced all over the world except India. So I spoke to a lot of people. I spoke to a lot of people during the process. I spoke to people who were actually running this lab outside India understood the challenges, uh, difficulties that comes with this lab. But I know that I have to do something in this space. So here's how I started India's first do-it-yourself biology lab. I, I proposed this concept to higher authorities in an esteemed university in Mumbai, and they agreed to help me and provided me with this beautiful space. So now we had the space. Our next challenge was to build a community. So we opened call for applications for people who want to work on such projects, want to uh, develop their ideas into something. And we got beautiful response. We have got 35 members that time who signed up for our lab and loved this concept. We were also featured by Hindustan Times uh, uh, article. And that was one of our milestones in that stage where we had nothing. And then we started building this community by do, uh, delivering a lot of seminars, workshops, and we gathered a lot of people around us. Now our next challenge was to build resources. So th the only answer for building resources was collection and collaboration because we had no funds. We only had space. So fortunately, one of my early interactions was with Padma Shri Dr. R.V. Hosur, who was the director of one esteemed university in Mumbai. He, he loved this concept, and he agreed to help us with all the knowledge and resources that he has. After collaboration also, there was need to build resources at the lab. So I decided to collect discarded equipment from research institutes, and we put them together in our lab uh, at minimal transportation charges. Our own community members repaired them, and we put it in a use. And that's how we began 13 DIY projects. So these are the collected equipment that we got from uh, institutes, colleges. Some, some also donated some glasswares to us so we could start. So we built 13 projects with these limited resources. And I knew that this is not enough. We will need more funds. So I decided to write several proposals for donations, grants, CSR. And most of them have got no replies. One, uh, five of them were rejected, which led to disappointment to all of us, to all our community members. But Giving up was never an option for me. So I wrote more proposals, and after two years of struggle, one of my proposals was accepted by BIRAC. And it was the happiest moment of my journey so far. It took us another two years for us to build the lab. And this is how it looks like. So this is an open science lab where we promote innovations, entrepreneurship, citizen science, and we, this is a house for 38 startups, 17 projects, and counting. Open science is also termed as citizen science, where people from different expertise, different backgrounds, they all come together, identify a common problem, and then they decide to find a solution for that. Now, why open science is important? Open science is important because it gives transparency of the research. So when you're doing the research, the research should be transparent to others so that they can replicate the same uh, effort that you have put in. Second, it gives the access to data and methods which are already been developed by some other researchers. And third, it provides collaboration for several researchers across the world, and they can build upon the advancements. 
open science is a movement. And to promote this movement, we've started another initiative, which is an international level conference, where we bridge the gap between experienced and budding researchers. And this is the impact so far. Open science is a movement, and I'm part of this movement. It has been quite a journey from a struggling biologist unable to find a space to creating a space for many such ideas, startups, and innovators. It has been a journey. In the end, I would like to say that open science uh, is needed in the society to build upon it and not to be restrictive about our own work. Thank you. <laughs>